Hey everyone, thank you for joining us again for another uh, video. This one's going to be packed with some great stuff. We have evangelist Derek Williams back with us all the way from his home in Walsingham. We're continuing on now with this subject, which is gaining great popularity more and more all the time, is living in the divine will era with the writings of Louisa Picaretta. Today, Derek has a special uh, topic for us to discuss, which is the three fiats. Those three fiats are creation, redemption, and sanctification. And we are in the era of sanctification. And with all that's going on in the world, the church, and everything else in this modern day, you'd think it was a time of doom and gloom, or the time of sin worse than Noah or Sodom and Gomorrah, as people keep saying in these blogs. I always try and promote the fact that we're getting prepared for this great era of peace. And where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And that's why I could already see why we'd be in the time of the era of sanctification. But without further ado, Derek, thank you so much for giving us your time coming back on the channel. I'm really looking forward to how you're going to break this down in the style that you do. I think you're great at how you teach it, and I'm very much looking forward to it. So without further ado, I'll give it over to you. Take it away. Jim Mark, and feel free to interrupt at any point when you want to sort of ask questions or anything else like that. But when I'm ever, whenever I'm speaking, because it's in the divine will, I like to place it in the divine will. And I just always say, okay, Jesus, you want to talk? So I'm going to talk with you, come divine will, come speak in my speaking. And that, that simple phrase, which was something Jesus taught us in Louisa's diaries, that's one of the ways that we can place an act in the divine will, which takes it from the human or divine mode into the eternal mode. And that's the all-important thing we need to do in this era. And I'll talk about that on another occasion. But this time I wanted to look at the contemporary situation. As you rightly said, people are a little bit almost obsessed about the, the mess the world is in. But um, Jesus has made it clear, this is the era of sanctification we're in. So we should be rather focusing, we should be refocusing our eyes on what God is doing rather than what man is doing. Because what man is doing is never up to much good. But what God is doing is always good. And it always gives us hope. We need to breed and cultivate hope in the soul. So we're looking at the three fiats, um, which are, you know, according to Louisa's doctrine in the book of heaven revealed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The first fiat is from Genesis 1, verse 3. Probably one of the most popular lines of the Bible God, in English, it's, and God said, let there be light, um, and there was light. In Latin, which is the, the fiat, the word fiat from the Latin, which was the, the church language at the time of Louisa, it's uh, fiat lux, be light, or let there be light. In the Hebrew, it's vaihi or, which I really like that, that word. Now, the Hebrew, interestingly, is far more directive. In English, it says, let there be light. It's almost like God is asking permission. In the Hebrew, it's bring light, vaihi or. It's like a directive, like God is willing something to happen and there's no request that's made. There's no sort of, let there be. Can we have? Please, some, will someone turn on the lights? It is a be, you know. And also, it's not so much God speaking as God wills. God wills the light and the, and the light happens, you know. Now, this is what we call the fiat of creation, the first fiat. And with this, God, God uh, creates the heavens, the earth, and populates them, fills them. And as we know, in our day and age, there's a strong disbelief in this now, growing, uh, that has been growing for a long time because of our, um, what I would call very dodgy scientific theories, um, we, you know, which have undermined uh, Genesis. And in the, in the Divine World Diaries, God actually tells us the purpose of creation, which was to glorify him. And if we're not recognizing that God, that creation was created by him to glorify him, we're undermining the actual purpose. And we're actually destroying hope. And hence why so many young people have got, have got no hope. And they're suffering with despair and they're suicidal because they see that they're not created for a purpose. They have no purpose in their life. Now, that is the fiat of creation, the first fiat. That fiat was, if you like, in place for 4,000 years from the time of Adam to the time of Christ. And then we have Our Lady speaking the second fiat. There's multiple things I can say about these fiats, which I'm going to keep drawing in as we go along. 
So the second fiat is in Luke chapter 1, and it's in verse 38. Mary says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. In the, in the Latin, the fiat mihi. Now let me explain one more thing about these fiats. Once again, from what we learned from Louisa's writings, the fiat of creation is the fiat of the Father spoken in union with the Son and the Spirit without the aid of a creature. Well, obviously, because no creatures were around at the time. The second fiat, the fiat of redemption, which I've just spoken out, fiat mihi, the fiat of Mary, that is the fiat of the Son, the fiat of the Redeemer. And he speaks the fiat in communion with the Son and the, with the Spirit and the Father. But he says, I speak it with the aid of a creature. And what's the, um, there's a book of that Louisa wrote called The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. And it talks about the fiat of redemption and how Mary is saying that when she spoke her fiat, um, she said she could see her fiat joining the fiat of the sun. And she say, she actually says, what a, what a surprise, what a beautiful surprise. And her fiat joins with the sun and, and then he is conceived within her womb. So that's the, the second fiat, the fiat mihi. And we have been in the era of redemption for the last 2,000 years and enjoying the fruits of redemption. But now we're in a new era. And this has been stated multiple times by different popes. Um, I think it was Pope John Paul II who said that a new era began at Vatican II, a new era in the life of the church. Um, and this era for us is called the Fiat Voluntas Tua, the era of sanctification, okay? This is Matthew 6, verse 10, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Now, what Jesus reveals to Louisa about this is that when he was on earth, he placed a prophecy within the Our Father prayer. That prophecy was called the Fiat Voluntas Tua. He's the one who speaks the prophecy, but it's the Holy Spirit who actualizes the prophecy because the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. He's the one who sanctifies the human soul. And he says that the church has been praying to the Our Father for 2,000 years, and in doing so has prepared itself and the, the world for the Fiat Voluntas Tua, the era of sanctification. Um, so, the, And the, the Holy Spirit is the one who actualizes this. So this is the era now of the Holy Spirit. And we've kind of seen this over the last 100 years with what we would call the charismatic renewal and other movements of the Holy Spirit that have produced great fruit in the life of the church. But those movements have eased off. And there is an important prophecy here, you see, um, about 80 years ago, there was a, a man, in, man who came from Bradford. You might know him. His name was Smith Wigglesworth. Do you, do you know the name? It doesn't stand out, but it's a name that okay. people can forget <laughs> once you hear the it. Name, the man Smith Wigglesworth was an extraordinary evangelist. He wasn't a Catholic, but he was a man really incredibly on fire for Jesus. And in the 1930s or 40s, he was in South Africa, and he went to meet a man called David Duplesny, I think it was, who was called the father of Pentecost, or Mr. Pentecost. And he went into his office, and he said to him that the charismatic movement, which at that time was alive and well, the Pentecostal movement, it was growing fast, um, would continue to grow. And he said that would take, take strength in the traditional church, i.e. for us, the Catholic church. And he said, and then there'd be another movement, a house church movement, that would also begin in the evangelical world. And he says, one, uh, eventually these two movements would kind of come together, and then they would diminish dramatically, which we've seen. But then he said, when that happens, out of the traditional church, will come a movement that will make the Pentecostal movement look like a joke. His words. Okay. Now, we're seeing that 
with this movement of the divine will, because we are seeing God entrust to his church the most extraordinary power and grace that has never been seen before. That is what is coming through with this era of sanctification and the fiat voluntas tua. And St. Louisa and Our Lady have got an incredible role to play in this because consecration to Mary is vital, absolutely necessity, because she's the one birthing children into the divine will. Louisa is the little daughter of the divine will. It's all her writings that give us the rich theology on the gift of living in the divine will. And I want to take a little look at what this gift is about. Well, first of all, I'll just pop it back to you, Mark. You've been writing away. You've always got questions. You've always got thoughts kicking off there. What is there anything you want to ping in at this point before I just continue going on and on and on? Because you know me, I can talk for an hour, right? <laughs> yeah, we both can when we've got our passions and talks, but this is absolutely brilliant, Derek. Uh, yeah, I'm writing little things down, like you say, with the taking of it, and it seems to make perfect fitting of these times you know the time of sanctification um the thing that comes to mind straight away is a few years ago one of the messages given at Medjugorje it was like when the father comes home it's not just like he's given the gifts to the children it was like something the word that was described in the, the language was he's shaking the bag make sure everything's out and that's the wow. time that we're in that's what's happening nothing is spared nothing is held back and what better time to be fitting than now and based on everything that you're saying? I like how you, like you say, you, the fiat voluntas tua, that era of sanctification that we are living in, is also what's being prepared by the Holy Spirit. So something's going to come like a renewal that we've been hearing about throughout the past century or so, especially with Our Lady's Marian apparitions. I love that bit where you say the fiat of Mary when she, she submitted to God's will and she conceived how that fused her with the God's divine will, which she was already living in anyway. We had it from the moment of her conception, yes. Yeah. But it makes me think of the devotion of the two hearts, the sacred heart and the magic. Yeah. They're one in terms mm -hmm. of will. And that you can't pray to one without the other. They're inseparable, mm. father and son, but inseparable because of that divine will as one. And that's where we really see how Mary is so elevated amongst all creation. Although she's not divine, she is beyond anything of measure, combined of all the angels and saints. Mm -hmm. So those were the little things that stood out uh, just as you were writing it. I'm going to follow up and search up that prophecy that you just gave from uh, about Smith Wigglesworth, was it? Smith Wigglesworth, yeah. 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 And it's not the only one. There's, there's, there's quite a few prophesied. Uh, a great revival and you know we have to be careful with this because when we look at revivals around the world we're looking at noise often and we're looking at you know the big event and the, the one where the crowds will attract christ warned us about this he said to be cautious about this he said where the body is dead of vultures will gather and so we have to be really careful when we look at a, a revival and or a perceived revival and we're looking at noise. The greatest revivals in the church have always come through the conversion of the one individual, the key individual. That key individual being ablaze with God and God bringing great grace through that individual. And so we have to look at, you know, where is the silence rather than the noise? Where is the sanctified soul rather than the noisy soul? Because the sanctified soul is always going to be quieter than the noisy soul. Is always going to be sorry. Is always going to be yeah. Is always going to be quieter than the non-sanctified. Sin produces noise. Holiness often produces uh, a, a silence. You know, and so we need to discern these things carefully. Also, we need to look at you know we're looking at the renewal of everything. So creation is being renewed by the children of the divine will. Now we're looking at creation at the moment and thinking it's being destroyed. We think creation is never going to recover. Even the Pope was warning about this the other day in one of his messages. Um, that it, you know We're looking at something that's not going to recover. Well, actually, the whole of creation is being renewed by the children of the divine will. And the, the creation will be completely renewed. What is destroying creation? Is it fossil fuels? Is it carbon footprint? Is it um, the destruction of forests for, for, for paper, etc.? 
No. One thing and one thing alone destroys creation, and that is sin. Personal sin. You want to stop you want to stop destroying creation. Stop using contraception. Stop having abortions. Stop doing the occult. So repent. That's the only way creation is going to be renewed through stopping sin. Um, now that's the renewal of creation. In the 1960s, um, our lady at Garabandal said she gave the church the Second Vatican Council. So the church renewal came, began, if you like, with the Second Vatican Council, which was consecrated by Pope John the Twenty Third, Pope Saint John the Twenty Third, and he called on the victory of truth. So we're talking about the triumph, and he was speaking about the triumph, the victory of truth. So the Vatican, Vatican II gave us this renewal. Now it didn't give us any new teachings. This is very important. It just opened up the teachings that were already there. I think it was the first council in the history of the church, possibly, where there was no condemnatory statements, because normally at a church council, they condemn the heresies. Not a single heresy condemned at Vatican II. It was just teachings, giving us the teachings in a, in a new, fresh way. And the renewal of the liturgy, that's something else that we have to look at, because there's a great resistance in the church, a division in the church at the moment, between those who like the, the old form of the Mass, the old rites, what we now call the extraordinary form, and the new form that the church gave us at Vatican II, or after Vatican II, the renewed liturgy. And we have to think, this is a renewal of the church, so the liturgy has been renewed, and we need to think about that and ponder that, because this is something that the Holy Spirit has given us once again. And are we being wise by rejecting gifts that the Holy Spirit is giving to us? Or are we are we clinging to the past or going moving forward into this era of sanctification? Now, going back to the fiat of sanctification, this is um this is from a, a doctoral thesis on the gift of living in the divine will by Father Joseph Inutzi. This is kind of like my catechism on the divine will. You know, I, I read this a lot and it's got great it's got his father joseph's theology is amazing and he defended this at the pontifical gregorian university in rome so it has the stamp of approval pontifical seal of approval on it and he he says this in the following message to louisa jesus reveals that the purpose of the third fiat of sanctification is to restore man to his original state so that's the pre fall state through the renewal of the of the human will in the divine will. And then he quotes Louisa. Jesus added, let us say fiat together. So he's talking to Louisa. And when we did, everything in heaven and on earth was filled with adoration to the supreme majesty. Then again, he repeated fiat. And Jesus' blood, wounds and pains arose and multiplied to infinity. That's the fiat of redemption. Then for the third time, fiat. And this fiat multiply in the wills of all souls to sanctify them. Now, don't forget that fiat comes both from Jesus, but it's also from Mary. The multiplication of the fiat of all souls to sanctify those souls. So this sanctification that we're in, it's not your work. It's not my work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. And I have to say that because many people I speak to about this say to me, oh, how can I do this? You can't. Impossible. Impossible for you, possible for God. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. We are cooperators with grace, not instigators. We are not the source of grace. We are the recipients of grace. And therefore, we cooperate with what grace is doing. How do we cooperate with what grace is doing? Well, Jesus gives us all the teaching on the divine will. We listen. We learn, we live. I like that. Three L's. We listen, we learn, we live. Just made that up there in Denmark. <laughs> then he said to me, my daughter, these three fiats are the creating, the redeeming, and the sanctifying fiat. In creating man, I endowed him with three powers, the intellect, the memory, and the will. And with three fiats, I will accomplish the work of man's sanctification. So Jesus speaking the fiats and the Holy Spirit actualizing them. Now, once again, people say, hold on a minute, who's doing the work, Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Well, once again, the catechism says that the word and the spirit 
are distinct but inseparable in their work. So they always work together. So every word I'm saying to you is only possible to speak through brief, through breath. And it's the same with the way the Trinity works. Whenever Jesus speaks, he breathes. Whenever he's breathing, he's speaking. So the Word and the Spirit are always working together. So we have here the era of sanctification spoken by Jesus, actualized by the Holy Spirit. A movement of the Holy Spirit founded on the Word of God. Distinct, but inseparable. Shall I carry on? Or do you have a few things you want to chip in here? Because you're looking at me quizzically. I've got some questions of things that you've touched on with the Vatican, Garib, and Dalnat, but let's get the teaching done and maybe come back to a few sure. things. Because I think, I mean, it's really good when we're in the zone. Okay, cool. So this is this is continuing from Louisa's diary, um, as, it, as expressed by Father Joseph in Nutsi, as translated by him, which is a really good translation. In the theatre of creation, man's intellect remained as though enraptured how many things he understood about me and about my love for him, who am hidden inside all created things to make myself known. So that's, sort of, once again, an important point, that everything we see in the world around us, God is veiled within absolutely everything. Tiny as well as huge, the leaf on the tree, the blade of grass, the stars, the galaxies. God is veiled within everything. And when Adam, before Adam fell, Adam could see God present in everything. He could see, it wasn't veiled like it is for us now. So God was hidden inside all great things to make himself known and to give us love so as to be loved. So in everything, Jesus placed his love. And so that Adam and us, we can look at everything and we can say, okay, Jesus, I can see you in the blade of grass i can see you in the leaf i can see you in the flower i can see you in the animals i can see you in the breath in the cloud in the sun in the stars and i can love you i can place my i love you in all this and this is what we're meant to do it's been loving god in his creation in the fear of redemption his memory remains as though enchanted by the excess of my love in suffering in order to help and save him in his state of sin. So the last 2,000 years, we have the writings of the saints and the teachings of the church unfolding for us the mystery of Christ's incarnation, life, suffering, death, and resurrection. So the mystery of redemption. And we're enchanted by the excessive of, love, of, of his suffering as seen externally. So we're looking at a cross, we're seeing the body of Christ on the cross, we're looking at the Eucharist and we're seeing Jesus give himself in the Eucharist as at the Last Supper. We're seeing his sufferings and his, and his resurrection. However, in the third fiat of sanctification, my love wants to display itself even more. So that bag that the Father shakes out that you were talking about earlier, which is a beautiful image, I want to assail the human will. I want to uphold man's will with my own will so that his human will may remain not only enraptured and enchanted, but sustained by an eternal will. Human generations will not pass until my will reigns on earth. My redeeming fiat will place itself in the middle between the creating fiat and the sanctifying fiat, and all three will interweave and accomplish the sanctification of man. The third fiat will give so much grace to man as to restore him to the original state, to his original state, as in before Adam fell, restored to that state. And only then, when I see man as I created him, will my work be complete. And I will take up my perpetual rest in the last fiat. So, be attentive, and together with me, help me to completely actualize man's sanctification. So that's from Louise's diary. I'll give you the diary entry, and we can pop it on the YouTube thing so that people can actually see what diary entry it was, and they can read it and ponder it. Um, and then they can see, okay, so this is what God is doing in me. So, number one, I do not have to worry about sin increasing because 
Jesus always knew sin was going to go crazy in these days. He knew man was going to run from him. Okay. I have to concern myself with the actualizing of the fiat of sanctification in my soul. That's going to be my focal point. Not the woke movements, not the LGBTQs, etc. Not the not the uh, growth of of the occult and Satanism and witchcraft. Those things are, are out there. They're happening. We feel like we're surrounded. We feel like we're probably under siege. We're not. God is entrusting us with the power of His own will, so that every single act I do has got the fullness of the divine power in it which makes me infinitely more powerful than all of them combined. And that's something we need to own. Their work appears more, more powerful because it's visible. My work appears to be weaker because it's invisible. But actually, it's the other way around. The work we do in the theater of sanctification is infinitely more powerful because it is so hidden their work is so much more weak because it is so visible and that which is visible is temporal and doomed to fade and not become anything and we can look at we, we only have to take a look back 100 years mark less than that you know we look at the evil of world war ii and what hitler and the third reich did and their vision was for a thousand year right how long did they last 12 years equivalent to the 12 tribes of israel that they wanted to destroy yeah 12 short years you know it's it's a tiny tiny measure in time and yes in that 12 short years how many souls were killed in that war 60 million 60 million souls even that number if we if we if we place that alongside another number it is minuscule since the 1920s to the night to the 2020s one billion babies aborted and that is now legal so we can actually place world war ii and the 60 million next to the number of innocent babies slaughtered and it's actually minuscule tiny tiny number that number of babies is even worse than the fact that it's legalized so we look at we look at the the evil of man which is visible but now we look at the the saints who are sanctified we're, we're recording this on the feast of saint faustina and saint faustina there is something beautiful in her diaries which fits in with the fear of sanctification because jesus is giving us new graces of sanctification which means he wants us to be in a deeper communion with him than we've ever been before we talk about the grace of mystical marriage and how the soul is raised up to the state of mystical marriage. But in the, since Jesus gave Louisa the grace of sanctity, this, this unique grace of living in the divine will, he's been able to raise souls up to the state of beatitude on earth. The state of beatitude. So the same state as the saints in heaven. So imagine that. You and me, if we cooperate with divine grace, our souls could be in the same state as the souls in heaven while we're still living on earth, okay? How is that possible? First, it's gift. So St. Faustina, it's her feast day. She wrote in her diary that it was revealed to her by Jesus that her soul was in the same state as the blessed saints in heaven. And that whether she was on earth or in heaven was irrelevant in one sense because he said, there's not going to be any difference for you. When you come to heaven, you'll be in the same state as what you are in now on earth. You'll just have the beatific vision. That you just have the beatific vision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You will have the beatific vision, but your soul will be in the same state. Yeah. The same was all said of Dina Balanja, Saint Padre Pio, and other saints of the of the twenty first of the twentieth century who god gave them this gift of beatitude on earth now that's got to be um taken to heart this isn't something we attain it's not something we get jesus prepares us all okay uh, so luckily here 
When I see him and as I, make, I created him, will my work be complete? And I'll take my perpetual rest in the last fiat. So be attentive. Help me to actualize man's sanctification. What is that sanctification? Well, on earth, the end result that Jesus wants to achieve is for everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ to have the state of beatitude on earth. He wants everyone to be in that state in the era of peace. Nothing can stop that. If you and I are going to live in the era of peace, we're going to be in a state of beatitude so that Christ can take up his perpetual rest in our soul. That's the end result. Now, we can actually make that happen sooner by our cooperation with grace, by our not giving life to our human will, which is the, the whole object of this. So in Louisa's diary, Jesus tells her that since Adam fell, he started doing his human will. And everyone since Adam, apart from Our Lady and Jesus, have done their human will. They've lived their human will. So for 6,000 years, the human will has reigned. Now we're in the era, beginning with Louisa, when the divine will is going to reign, which means there will only be one will in operation on earth, which will be the divine will. At the moment, there's over 7 billion wills in operation, which is what's causing sin, war, and yes, earthquakes, volcanoes, famines. Um, it's causing uh, powerful hurricanes like typhoons. How can, the, how can the human will do this? Because we affect creation. You know, we are the lords of this creation. If we're at war in ourselves, then nature's going to make war on us. If the, if the human will is handed over to God, and God infuses his, his will into the human soul, which is what he wants to do, so that the divine will is the operative will, and he's sanctifying the soul, then the human soul becomes at peace. The conflict within us ceases. Our, our internal war stops. Peace reigns within us. So imagine you've got 10 people living in the na same neighborhood who, in whom God's divine will actually reigns, not just as a gift that they're trying to live in, but it actually reigns. Those 10 souls will be at peace within themselves, completely at peace. God's peace completely reigning in those 10 souls. Multiply that out to a country. That country will be completely at peace. Every soul in beatitude. Multiply that out to the nations. Every soul on earth completely at peace interiorly and therefore creation also at peace this is the era of peace this is the era of sanctification where every soul is restored to its pre-fall state beatitude on earth that's what we're aiming for with our era of peace okay i'm going to take a breath you want to chip in on anything there yeah a few things well, I don't know if you just skimmed it there, though, because obviously the thing that's coming to my mind is, you know, we're sinners, we're going to confession and things like that. Uh, how is it going to be where the nation all or the world is in that era of divine will, that era of peace, where we could be having that gift of living sinless, just like the souls in heaven we're living it on earth, we still don't have the beatific vision, but we're in that same state as the saints in heaven, just like Saint Faustina was on earth. Obviously, she never sinned for after her last confession till her death, because that's the thing that breaks it, isn't it? Is sin. What's mm -hmm. going to happen in order for an entire planet of billions of people to live in the divine will? First, let's look at me and you. Um, Jesus gives us these 36 volumes in the Book of Heaven, which are highly detailed um, descriptions, a roadmap as to how we're going to live in the kingdom of the divine will. He also gives us a book called The Hours of the Passion, also written by Louisa, which are meditations on his last 24 hours, where we can actually enter into his last 24 hours. And he tells Louisa that the soul who meditates upon these particular hours when he sees the soul reading about the scourging, he actually sees the scourging take place in the soul. So the soul takes on the scourging without feeling anything because it's by faith, right? Um, so they have a particular efficaciousness to them. 
Then there's a book called The Kingdom of the, Div the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Kingdom of the Divine Will, where Our Lady herself gives us 36 teachings on how we are going to live in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. So Our Lady instructing us, Jesus instructing us, Louisa instructing us, um, St. Joseph praying for us, um, the saints in heaven now interceding for us for this era of peace. We have to cooperate. Number one, we have to listen to Louisa's teachings, not make up our own way. There's no, there's no, you know, people once again come to me, you know, and they say, oh, I did this and I did that. And they think this is living in the divine will. And I'm saying, no, you're not following Louisa's teaching. Louisa makes it very clear what we need to be doing every single day. It's no, there's no, um, there's no, not many doubts surrounding it. It's very simple. You know, at the start of day, we place our will in the divine will and we make a determined effort not to give life to our will that day. And we do certain things each day throughout the day called prevenient acts, actual acts, um, whereby we invite the divine will to reign in our soul as we journey through the day. You know, so I'll give you an example of this because it follows it flows a little bit from Ignatian principles. You know, you wake up at the start of the day and you just think about your day and you ask for God's blessing upon it. But this is more fixed, more clear. Um, you wake up at the start of the day and you go through your day. So I'm going to get up, get a shower, clean my teeth, go get breakfast, um, maybe, uh, maybe uh, get to morning mass, pray the rosary, have the video chat with Mark. Um, have a lunch time and do some work in the afternoon on a laptop in the evening do this uh, conversation with someone elsewhere in the world on the video so you go through your day uh, what you think is going to happen and as you're doing it you're placing every single act in the divine will so you're preempting your acts and saying okay Jesus I'm placing that in your divine will that in your divine will that in your divine will before it happens everything placed in the divine will that causes the sun of the divine will to rise in your soul. Okay, so the sun is shining. Now, as you go through your day, the clouds of the human will will come on in and try to cloud over the sun. So you do your actual acts in the divine will. And you, as you're doing your acts, you're saying, okay, Jesus, come divine will in this meeting so at the start of this meeting i said a prevenient act jesus wants to speak so i'm going to speak with him jesus wants to listen so we're going to listen with jesus so we're not giving life to our human will we're giving life to the divine will letting the divine will reign in the soul which means that every single act we do because it's a because it's done in the divine will becomes a divine act with an eternal infinite quality about it okay now, let me read to you from Louisa's volume, February the 16th, sorry, volume 16, February the 10th, 1924. And this is what Jesus has got to say about Louisa's volumes, about Louisa's writings, okay? So this is for you and everyone listening. Pay attention to this because, I'm pointing at the screen now, Mark, I'm telling the listeners, the watchers, pay attention because this is for you. This is what Jesus is going to do in your soul, okay? This is for you. In my all-encompassing vision. So Jesus was speaking to Louisa in 1924 about what's going to happen in you. In my all-encompassing vision, I see that these writings will be for my church like a new sun that will rise within her midst. And her members, drawn by its blazing lights, will seek to be transformed in this light and become spiritualized and divinized subsequently by their having renewed the church they will transform the face of the earth so the writings which were released to the, to the church in 1997 by john paul ii sorry cardinal ratzinger are the orders of john paul ii so they were released from the vatican where they'd been for 50 years published made accessible to us now we have teachings on them. We have a doctoral thesis on them. The people who have got these writings will be drawn by the blazing light of the divine will because they will see that as they do their acts in the divine will, the sun has risen and it brings great peace. It brings love. It heals the wounds of the soul. It heals the traumas. It's transforming them. It's divinizing them.
It means everything I'm doing throughout the day has an eternal, infinite effect. Consequently, I'm being transformed by this light. The light of the divine will is transforming me. Not anything I'm doing. The light of the divine will is transforming me. And I am you, everyone listening who's doing this, you're being spiritualized and divinized by the blazing light of these writings that Jesus gave us. Consequently, the children of the divine will are renewing the church. So once again, don't worry about what's happening in the church because you, me, those children of the divine will who are doing their acts in the divine will are renewing it. We're cleaning up the mess by our acts. <laughs> Subsequently, we will transform the face of the earth. This is the power Jesus has entrusted to us. If you like, we are the end time army of the Proto-Evangelium. You know, when, when Adam fell, God said to Adam, or to the serpent, she will crush your head while you strike at his heel. At her heel. Yeah? She will crush your head while you strike at her heel. The Hebrew word for heel can translate as the rear of an army. And we are the rear of the army, the end time saints. We're the ones who Satan is trying to strike the heel, but we're the ones who are going to crush his head. And how many of us, how many souls in this end time army, how many souls who are consecrating themselves to Mary, who are coming back to Medjugorje and Fatima and Garabandal, how many souls who are now living in the divine will at one point, we're well and truly under Satan's bite. Mm -hmm. How many of us were actually in that state of incredibly serious sin, of promiscuity or pornography or occult or whatever we were into, and Our Lady has drawn us out of that and she has now given us the power to crush the head that was actually trying to bite us. And we are now crushing that head through these writings. We're crushing Satan's dominion, first of all in our life, then in the lives of our families and friends, and then in a more universal, in the church, crushing the attack of Satan on the church. That's the children of the divine will. Amen. Just in that note, when you're bringing up the apparitions again, I know everyone knows me. <laughs> uh, when I Go for it, Mark. Go for it. <laughs> When asked that question, you know, you gave a great answer, a long-winded answer, where it's personal change, it's the personal side of the sanctification. See, also for me, what I was kind of thinking it might have led to as well, to renew the face of the world and the times that we live, living in the divine will. That's where I see the prophecies or the events of Marian apparitions unfolding. Because to, I think we're over 8 billion people on the planet now, I believe, or we're near it if we're not already over it. And it's going to keep, it'll increase more quickly because of longevity of life and everything. Now, when these events all come, as Our Lady said, for example, in Medjugorje, she wouldn't have to appear again in this way. What I began in Fatima, I will accomplish, fulfill here in Medjugorje, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. That is that era of peace promise from Fatima. So I think and we are doing what we are doing, which is slowly increasing the awareness, the teachings, and hopefully the conversions of people one by one. But really, I think to get the 8 billion people in the way the world is right now, this divine act and divine intervention coming directly from God is what's really going to renew the face of the earth, is what we pray to the Holy Spirit. Now, when you did say earlier, you know, about us as human beings made an image and likeness of God, and we're going to return to that original state as Adam was created, which we're all supposed to be anyway. The only thing in between that is sin. So we need to eradicate the sin through this growth and conversion and holiness. But it's intellect, memory, and will. It made me think... Uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth said uh, about 10, 12 years ago, uh, you know, we're living in a time where there is an eclipse of reasoning. 
And, you know, and the whole point of reasoning is where we're using our intellect. Yes, we have emotions, but the emotions seem to be the thing that's leading so many people of this generation. We're all basing it on our gut, based on emotions. We're offended at this, or this seems nice and pleasant, or whatever's happy and less inconvenient. That's all about emotions. And we've lost that objective reality that we should be getting, and that's in the intellect. And therefore, I find it very fitting for these times that the whole point of which she says at Garabandal, even St. Faustina in her diary, who it is her feast day today as we're recording, she, Garabandal, and, and many other saints and mystics spoke about that great time of the illumination of conscience. And now with that title, the illumination of conscience, let the scales drop take the eclipse of reasoning in a way and realise that reality of correcting our conscience in line with the divine will. That's why it's such a promising time. That's why you can see it's the time of grace, as our lady keeps referring to it. That's why we can see why now it has to happen. And I love that quote that you gave in the diary. I don't know if you got the, the full date, but we got the year 1924 it was done. Well, next I'm year... February 10th. February. Yep. I can't think of that date and other things like I do with October 13th, May 13th. <laughs> I'll let you look that one up. But the fact that it was 1924, and we're right now working through this synod, which is just beginning, the Great Synod, which will convene, obviously, with the 50th anniversary of Akita, which, again, Garabandal spoke about the time of the Great Synod. But of course, they spoke about a time of a schism. You know, so we are alert to the times, but where the sin abounds, grace abounds more. And I love how the fact that you're saying, like, it's the loudness, the devil's the roaring lion. Mm -hmm. God is the gentle whisper in the cave. And it made me think of the Carthusians. I was there for a week years ago, living at Park Minster, mm -hmm. part of a come and see. And it's, it's normal for the men to actually have a panic attack within the first couple of days. They warned me about it because you get wow. so deep into every day of silence, living in stillness and silence, undisturbed, apart from when you go to prayer and mass, which always with a chance. But that stillness, it's like the scuba diving I done years ago. You go under the water in a swimming pool or the ocean, you still hear some sort of noise, but it's silenter. But then you go deeper and you go deeper in the water. That's what the silence was like for me. And the few silent retreats I went on, it reminded me of the one back in Rome at seminary. We went away somewhere at the coast. And I remember like four or five days into the silence, I'm sitting there in the shallow bit of the beach with the water coming over. And you're like every grain of sand under the water or on the beach, every grain is created, is accounted for by Almighty God. And it just makes me think, like you say there, we get to that point where we're in the silence and the focus, because this world is distraction, 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 clips of reason and everything else, all the ways of media. And if you just get rid of that and go away for those few days, it's by our very own nature that we're going to start looking at those considerations, those little thoughts, whatever purpose they may serve, but it's starting to clear out the mind. It's starting to get back to that place where we were created, considering creation, considering God, and being left in awe that all this stuff that doesn't seem to be serving any purpose in life has been willed into creation anyway. But the fact that a few days' silence can start making you think like that, and that's the thing that things jump at me as you speak. Let's throw as a challenge to our, our viewers still here at this point. Let's let's actually give them a thin end of the silence wedge, you know, because I bet most of them would love to go over those days of silence, but they're thinking, how can I do that? I've got all this going on in my life. So let, let's give them a, a thin end of the wedge, a starting point on cultivating silence. And let's say, tell you what, folks, switch off your mobile at 8 p.m. Just try it. One night, two nights a week, switch off your mobile. Take a silence from all that invasive texting and communications. No, but you know, you've probably got a landline. <laughs> they can probably, people can get hold of you. You're not cutting yourself off from the world, but you just 
taking a break and notice what happens when you switch off your mobile and maybe leave it in the car so it's outside of the house somewhere and um, leave it in the garage somewhere leave it hidden and just have a night where there's no television on there's no computer there's no mobile phone and just recognize the difference just that tiny act is going to do and then build on that and yeah eventually get into that deeper water you know you said a few things there mark but i really wanted to sort of draw on that i that i um you talked about the memory intellect and will god's original purpose for the memory intellect and will you see one thing about louisa's diary this is she's taught she's teaching us about the interior life of god the interior life of mary and our interior life so it's self-knowledge and knowledge of god working together and what she says is the original purpose of our memory intellect and will was to be a dwelling place of the trinity so the father his dwelling place was the will the son's dwelling place was the intellect and the holy spirit's dwelling place was the memory so our memory intellect and will were meant to be excuse me filled with divine thoughts and processes and willfulness filled to overflowing so that's the first thing i wanted to point out the second thing was about the marian apparitions you see um we live we live in a protestant nation and therefore there's a lot of anti-catholicism feeds through which i think i think um sort of um makes it hard for us to quite comprehend the role of mary you know, we will, we're working on it by grace. Look at what we've done. You know, we're both consecrated, both into Medjugorje, Fatima, all these Marian apparitions. But a priest friend of mine went to Italy last year for, for, um, for a study. He was doing a MA in Mariology, I think it was. And he said, the number of books in Italian on Mariology is breathtaking. He said it, it completely outweighs what we have in English. We've got nothing compared to what the Italians have got. And I was thinking, how, how much can you write on Mary? And obviously you can write a heck of a lot, right? <laughs> but I thought then also about these saints like Padre Pio, how devoted they were to Mary, how their relationship with Mary was so intimate and so, so dependent like a child on its mother. Now, I've been consecrating myself to Mary for over 30 years using the method of de Montfort and now using the method of Louisa. But I'm still just, I'm still learning so much about this incredible woman and how she was used so powerfully by God and how God is using her now to bring in the era of peace. Because at Fatima, she said something very interesting. She didn't say she had come to establish devotion to Immaculate Heart. She said, my son wishes to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart. So it's her son's will that wants this devotion. Why? Well, again, picking on something you said, you talked about the 8 billion souls. Sadly, in Louisa's diaries, as well as in tradition and in the Bible, it teaches us that the majority of people are going to reject this gift. And therefore, they will not survive the chastisement which is coming. And they cannot stay because this world is going to be set aside for the kingdom of the divine will. So if they're not want the divine will, Jesus is going to remove them by chastisement, which is also how he saves souls. So they have the choice. That choice is going to be coming at the warning, in my belief, to a, to a great extent. The illumination of conscience. That's when we're going to receive great graces of sanctification. And it's when other souls are going to be given the grace to repent or alternatives um, and for us it's going to be a harvest time so we have to prepare ourselves now for this harvest we have to be ready for this harvest coming in which is going to be breathtaking hundreds of millions of souls entire nations converting back to christ we know england is going to convert back to the catholic faith if we just harvested england that would give us 60 million souls pretty much england scotland wales united kingdom yeah um so that would give us i mean i, I don't know about you i've i've evangelized a few thousand souls <laughs> through conferences and things i cannot comprehend evangelizing a million let alone 60 million let alone a couple of hundred bit million i can't comprehend that so jesus is going to give us great great graces in order for us to bring these souls in after the after the illumination of conscience which is what we're preparing ourselves for so that is a very important thing but it will be followed by the great chastisements because 
for the era of peace to happen, souls who want war will have to leave the planet. And there's only one way to leave the planet at the moment. So they will have to go. They can't stay. And Jesus makes this clear. The majority of souls will die in the chastisement because they will reject the gift. And my kingdom is going to reign. And if they do not want the kingdom to reign in their lives, then they cannot stay. So for us, it's a simple thing. Yes, I want this gift. So the chastisement will be not a, not a problem for us. Mary is preparing us for us. Mary gives us the refuge of her immaculate heart. Mary gives us the teaching on the divine will. Mary gives us all the graces on the divine will. So everything that we're learning about the divine will being fused into the soul is coming through the intercession of Mary and Louisa, who is the little herald of the divine will. So ultimately, we have nothing to fear. Our thing now is, am I preparing myself for the good stuff that's coming? Because for me, the evil has been happening for 6,000 years. It's the good stuff that's coming now. Amen. And on that note as well, though, Derek, I mean, just for the audience of that, clarifying whoever's watching, because many people in the faith, for example, are living, I mean, Nerd Lady says the main thing is in Garb and Dallas, you know, lead good lives. You know, very simple, lead good lives. And we know what that means with a moral compass. It comes to living mm. communion with the church, away from grave sin, the sacraments, etc. We see it with the messages in Medjugorje, with prayer, fast, and scriptures, etc. Monthly confession being the big one. We need that clear out when it comes to the confessional, for sure. Um, but hopefully, as the more we're sanctifying ourselves, the less we should probably need to worry about sin. As uh, the mm. case with St. Faustina, Louisa, and and everyone else mm -hmm. in the divine will. Um, is that a, does Louisa make it clear, or is it a personal interpretation when it comes to the times of, will, be, will we be the ones also taken with chastisements or purifications? Because unless there's something very clear with the divine will writings, I haven't made a clear judgment of myself that, Although I'm aware of all this, although I'm preparing for it spiritually, even a little bit as the prepper in me, a little bit of food here, a little bug out plan there, whatever in case, based on certain prophecies, I don't know whether I am the one that's going to be safe, or maybe going to these refuges that are some mystic priests, priests are speaking about in recent stuff, but at the same time I'm less and less concerned because if I'm living a life that's pleasing to God and God's will, then it doesn't matter if I stay or if I, if I die or if I'm martyred or whatever, because God's will be done. And I'm okay with that more and more as I live yeah. in the life. And that's a, that's a key thing for me is the fact, because a few years ago, years prior, I was probably a bit more influenced with paranoia, uh, hypochondriac, you know, what if I die? Mm -hmm. well, that's disappeared virtually in 10 15 years from mm. and i know it because that sense i think the first thing you touched on is if we're living and if we feel interior peace and we're doing everything god's asked of us that's probably a good sign that we're on a good way hopefully um but the whole long-winded thought of this is some people they might be aware of the pilgrimage, the apparitions, they've been in pilgrimages, they're doing their first Saturday devotions, they're loving the messages of Medjugorje or, or other ones. Um, but they might not say, oh, that divine will is just a little too much for me, it's too heavy. Or, you know, if people find their own devotion, some are into the divine mercy, some prefer the sacred heart devotion, you know, over the mm. century or whatever. So, but it says that like, you're saying there, if, if they're living in the divine will, we have nothing to worry about for all these chastisements to come. Is that a personal interpretation a little bit? Is there something more direct with what Louisa says? Because even, mm -hmm. even, even there's a quote of Padre Pio, I believe that the martyrs of Europe will pay for the great miracle of Garib and Dal. So many mm -hmm. of the faithful will go through martyrdom or whatever. And even in Akita, which I think the great chastisement in the Akita prophecy, you know, with fire falling from the sky, up to two thirds of humanity would be wiped out, sparing mm -hmm. neither priest or faithful. So in a way, mm -hmm. that seems to be at the very end of a concession of things as the labor pains and the world's been renewed. Mm -hmm. 
based on all that, then where are is it a personal thing, uh, interpretation? No, no, no. Okay, so with Louisa does make this very clear. She makes it clear in the eyes of the passion and in her own diaries that um, the children of the divine will will actually have power over the chastisements. And, yeah, we have, because you and I are in the process of chastisement. It's actually happening, and we're cooperating with the chastising touch of God on the soul. The purpose of the chastisements is to purify the world of those souls who do not want the gift of living in the divine will. You said at Akita, and it's also in Louisa, that two-thirds will perish. It's also in the prophet, I think, the prophet Nehemiah. Two-thirds will be cut off, one-third will pass through the fire. Yeah? So that means that there's going to be around about, if we take the numbers, around two billion, two to three billion souls who are going to pass through the chastisements into the era of peace. Those two billion are going to be children of the divine will. Um, because Jesus wants to establish the kingdom of the divine will. This is not an era like previous eras where Jesus was causing, Jesus was permitting the church to suffer in a particular way, like in the early church, you know, the blood of the martyrs and so on, countless martyrs in order for a nation to be evangelized, for the Roman Empire to be conquered. This is different. This is not the conquest of the Roman Empire. This is the establishing of a kingdom. So we're in a new era we're not in the era of redemption. We're now in the era of sanctification. So it's new goalposts. Now, you talk about... So Jesus needs souls to be here after the chastisement. And the only souls that can be here after the chastisement are those in whom the divine will reigns. Not as a gift, but as a permanency. So the divine will actually reigns in those souls as a permanent gift, not something that comes and goes, but as something in which they do not step out of. So they are completely sanctified on earth. Okay. For the glory of God. For the glory of God. Okay. So that's clear. That's very, very clear in Luis's writings. We're coming into an era of peace. What point would an era of peace be if all the Catholics have been wiped off the planet and the only ones left are those who want war? That would be logical. Our Lady wants people on earth who want peace who want peace first and foremost in their heart, not just for financial gain. You know, people talk about peace all the time, but they live their lives in contrary to peace, you know? So they're not actually pursuing peace. They're pursuing wealth, material goods, sin. They're pursuing things which offend God. How can that be a life of peace? So Louise tells us that souls who live a simple life, like Our Lady of Garbandal, a good, simple life, that's what she's looking for. And that's what the divine will does. It helps us to simplify our life. Um, let's continue. You spoke about Akita. I covered that. You spoke about um, Medjugorje. Our lady is going to give us the signs. And she also tells us at, at Medjugorje, have your conversion. So she's not telling us, get your children converted. She's telling us, have your conversion. This time is for you. This is for your conversion. So it's not good me saying to my kids, oh, you've got to all have your conversion to Jesus. I must have my conversion. And then I won't need to tell my kids anything because they will see my authentic conversion and they will walk in it. They will follow in that way. Yeah. One of the reasons why people do not convert to the faith is because the people who witness it aren't doing a good witness. And that was Mahatma Gandhi who actually said words that effect. You know, he said, I'd be, he said, if, I think he virtually said I'd be a Christian, but for Christians. <laughs> yeah. So we have got to have a deeper conversion. So that chastisement has to have effect. Now he said something else which provoked a thought in me. I don't know if it was to do with Kabanda or if it was to do with the renewal of the church or Medjugorje, but he said something. And, and I thought, oh, the martyrs of Europe. Thank you. Yes. Once again. <laughs> Our Lady talks about this in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. Louisa writes about it. The greatest martyrdom that the soul can suffer is the martyrdom of its own will. So he says that a soul which is truly putting its own will to death in inverted commas all day, every day, so that the Divine Will can reign all day, every day. He says there is the greatest martyrdom. So the greatest martyrdoms are happening in the church now with souls who are saying all day, every day, your will, not mine. Your will, not mine. Jesus, come divine will, come reign, 
constrain in me. Let not let my will be completely at rest, and let the divine will completely reign in me. You know, come divine will speak in my speaking. Come divine will walk in my walking. Come divine will gaze in my gazing, and doing the rounds of creation. So living Louisa's teaching, Jesus says this is the greatest martyrdom. He calls it the martyrdom of martyrdoms. Because every say, every martyr prior to Louisa died according to their human will. Their human will was the one that was alive, but they were doing God's will. We are different. We are putting our actual human will at rest so that God's will can reign constantly the martyrdom of martyrdoms, the sanctity of sanctities, and the science of sciences. It's almost too simple to understand sometimes when you put it like that. You know, the difference... Well, praise God, Mark. Praise act. God. <laughs> it is, it's almost too simple to say, come <laughs> thine will, rather than say, Lord, this is what I'm offering to you. It's no, like... This is it. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting, but this is it. This is what the evangelist does. The evangelist takes the rich theology of the Word of God, of Louis's writings, and he makes it palatable. He enables the soul to chew it and digest it. That's the po that's the whole point of the evangelist. There, yeah? he brings peace to the soul because the soul could now accept something that it couldn't accept before. Making things simple is vitally important because this gift is for the simple. And it's always the way it usually happens with God, even like the apparitions. How many times is it to mm. young children, not of great education, even back in the 1900s, Fatima, Garabandal, etc. A lot of times, it, in La Salette, it's always young children. Keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's how Louisa was. She was very simple, and she wasn't well-educated. And, and there we have... Um, Jesus using that beautiful soul to give us this rich doctrine. It's all teaching from Jesus. Amen. There's a lot in it. I can sense we've probably got a good time maybe to bring it into conclusion because I think we've been on a good hour. Uh, is yeah. there anything else you'd like to finalize in a nutshell? Anything at all? Not at this point. What I'd like to say, Mark, is, um, is, is just to give the listeners a, a head up. It, that when we do our next one, um, we're going to look at the the prevenient act and the actual act, so that people are saying, okay, how do I do this practically? Well, we'll take a look at the practical day to day living in the divine will, in the in the actual act and the prevenient act, and these acts that we will do every day will help you to will will enable you to accept the gifts Jesus wants to give you which will sanctify your soul. So I've talked about the sanctification and the fear to sanctification. Now we're going to say, okay, now let's see how it works. Day to day, how you can be sanctified according to what Jesus wants to do in this era in the church. Brilliant. Amen. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure having you again. There's definitely food for thought there. I would even encourage the audience to maybe replay back certain parts as I do myself because sometimes it takes that second or third uh, replay of listening to really get it sinking in and keep pondering. That's a key word that's came up for me in the past couple of years with Our Lady. She pondered everything in her heart and always ask her for that guidance for sure and the Holy Spirit. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us again I like Derek how you say for the next video so we know we're getting more <laughs> coming this way, hit the thumbs up, share the video keeps the algorithm promoting this stuff and that's how we evangelize to more and of course hit the subscription button and the bell icon in order to be notified of the next coming videos and please share it far and wide through WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter and anything else you're using and of course, that goes for Derek's channel also from the Pistinia. Link will be in the description box. You've been seeing things pop up on the screen along the way. It takes a second to do the same on both channels. And there's a lot more content there with Derek giving snippets as well as long videos. Let's help him get to a thousand subs. Let's help the Lord spread the, the divine will teachings and bring in this new promised era. Let's do our part. And until next time, take care. God bless. God bless, Sophia.
man. 